First off, let me say that it's an honor to be here. I have met so many nice people here in just a few minutes that I was here, and I know that you have a, an area here where you support something that's good with this museum, and you're all here today, and uh, like I say, I have never been in this area. At my age, it's good for me to be just anywhere. <laughs> say that I had a luncheon here and uh, usually whenever I eat pretty well like that I uh, usually take a nap. <laughs> if you start dozing off well, then that's fine. I understand it. Uh, but anyway I'll start off by going back to my basic training and let you know a little bit about that and get some of the highlights of what happened along the way. Uh, my name is Guy Prestia and uh, I was born in a place called Burnstown, part of Elwood City. And uh, it's just a small community there. And I was born in 1922, April of 26. And uh, I grew up during the Depression days. So today I am 97, 97 years old. And uh, it's good to be up around. And <laughs> one gentleman asked me, do I go to different places? And I've been to about maybe 18 or 20 different schools uh, over the, my area here when I started. When we first came home from the service, none of us even spoke about it, even to our own families. We didn't know that. I wondered about it, so I made out a survey and wanted to find out what the problem was. Well, in World War II, there were 18 million people involved in that war. Whenever you count the soldiers, you count the wax, you count the waves, you count the nurses, the, the, the pilots, and all those people, there were 18 million. So when we come out from there, everybody went back to their own families or their own jobs and just carried on. When I come out of the service there, I didn't even get to see a doctor. Today they operate things a little different. When people come home from Iraq, and I'm glad to see that, a lot of people get that post-traumatic stress and one thing and another, but they get checked over and they get, they get to the place where they can get help. And, uh, but when we come home, uh, we just didn't have that. And it's the same thing, and, I, and I'll mention this because with the, uh, with the club that I belong to, the uh, Breakfast Club, uh, out of Pittsburgh, uh, we see a lot of Vietnam veterans coming there. And it's a good thing because for a good many years they got a bad rap. They got no respect in that war, whether it was because it was unpopular or whether it lasted too long when it went on for 12, 15 years. What happened then, but they got no respect. Now they're getting the respect that they deserve. The way I look at it, when you're in the service, and especially if you go in a place of danger, and you're in a place of combat, you deserve your respect, no matter what branch of the service. And so I got my basic training. I got uh, drafted in 1942. Then my basic training took me down to Camp Wheeler, Georgia. That's right outside of Macon. So I went down there for those 13 weeks, and after that training was over, we had all kinds of uh, maneuvers. The first thing, when you're in the infantry, you do a lot of walking, so we did a lot of hiking. And then we went on a rifle range, and we learned about the different kinds of rifles and the different weapons that we could use. But back then, uh, there were camps all over the country, and I don't think the Camp Wheeler is even there anymore. It was like a temporary camp. So after I finished there, they sent me up to Blackstone, Virginia, up in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains to take mountain maneuvers. And uh, I wound up there at Camp Pickett. And they were waiting for the 45th Division, which had moved clear across the country to different states. Originally, they were National Guards, and uh, they originated in uh, Oklahoma, 
uh, Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico, those four states. And so at the time, too, before I got in the service, the uh, emblem that they had on their patch, on their shoulder patch, was a swastika. And uh, of course, that had to be changed because uh, uh, they found out what Hitler was doing, and they found out that that was his symbol. So they changed it. And the only difference uh, on the design, the only restriction was it had to be a patch with four sides representing those four states, the Hoover National Guards. It was Oklahoma, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. So that's what we have there. We have the, that bird here, that Thunderbird, called the Thunderbird. That's a 45th. And they'd have, the, the, it's an Indian omen, the same way that the, that the uh, swastika was. The uh, Indians prayed to that big bird because out in the western states, they had arid country, it was dry, the garbage couldn't grow, so they had this bird that came across there, a big bird, and it had lightning coming out of its eyes, and whenever it flapped its wings, it made it thunder. And then on top of its back, it had this great big lake of water. <coughs> and whenever it flew over the dry lands and the gardens needed water, it just rolled over and dumped all that water on the land there. That's what they believed in, and that's what they have. But we saw that, too, in the 45th Division, because when we were in Italy, there were days here where it, just, it didn't stop raining, there, especially at Monte Cassino. But uh, every, all the vehicles were buried down to the axles, and you couldn't move out of there. But that's in, in part of my talk here, too. So the outfit was moving across, and they got up to Pine Camp in New York. And then they came down to uh, Blackstone, Virginia, to get on ships to go overseas. And that was the 45th Division, so I went overseas with them. And when we got there, we went, we left on June the 3rd, 1942. And we got to Iran, Africa on the 22nd. Now the reason it took so long to get there was because they said that there were U-boats and submarines under the water there, so uh, we wanted to uh, avoid them one way or another, so we zigzagged different places. We didn't go on a straight line. And, but I did see depth charges that they dropped because they, through their sounding system, they found out that there were some U-boats and some uh, other boats under there, like the submarine. <coughs> so they dropped the bare barrels of uh, uh, explosions down in there. And he would drop them on it then every day. But we didn't hit anything because if we hit anything there, we would get an oil spill. You would see an oil spill in the, out in the water. So we never saw anything like that. So we were safe that way. So we wound up in Iran. Uh, my older brother had been in North Africa from the beginning, and that campaign was winding down. And General Patton was a Patton there with the tank divisions. My brother was in the NACAC outfit uh, with a 40 millimeter bore force. And uh, so he stayed in there until that campaign was over. Then they transferred him over to Italy to uh, combat engineers and they built bridges and things like that. So then we were getting prepared. They gave us a, a, a flyer that had a picture of an island and it said Sicily on there. And we thought, well, that's where we're going to go. We're going to go in there. So uh, we went in on uh, July the 10th, 1943. And uh, we were supposed to go in two weeks earlier than that. But somehow or other, they had figured a storm was going to come. <coughs> they had a wild storm which it did. They, we waited and they figured, well, nobody would expect anybody would invade their country during a storm like that. The breakers on the water on the Mediterranean were 13 foot high. It was just wild. So we had these cargo nets and we come down there on the ladders. We come in and uh, 
I was in on the first wave, and we got in the smaller boats and, and went to the shore. It was like 2 o'clock, 2.30 that morning of, of July the 10th. And when, when, when we went in there, we were supposed to hit a sandy beach in all our training. You're supposed to go in there up to the line where the beach is, and then they would open the door in the front, and you'd walk out. Maybe the deepest water would be like up to your knees or something like that. The boat that I was on, the commander on there, he made the first mistake. <laughs> he had all the ones with the rifles and everything to fix rifles. And I don't know why he, he gave that order. And then he figured when well, we were going to hit land, we're going to have hand-to-hand -hand fighting right away. So we had everybody crouched down and fix their bayonets. I couldn't do that because I was a BAR man. I carried a Browning automatic rifle. And it, it's not made to carry a, a bayonet. So I didn't have that. So when we went in, uh, of course, the guys from the Navy, they piloted those boats to get in there. Like I say, we're supposed to hit the sandy beach, but they missed that. <coughs> we, and what happened, we hit a great big rock, smashed up against the shore on this big rock. And uh, we were supposed to either go to Jaila or uh, Skogliga, those two beaches here, but we didn't go to either one of them. So the, uh, the uh, young fellow from the Navy, he used his head, he kept gunning the engine to keep that up against the rock. So the first guy climbed out of there and pulled the next one out, and each one pulled each person out of there, and we get everybody out on shore. But during that process, when we hit those big rocks, the guys that had these, these guns with bayonets on them, they stuffed the guy ahead of them. Some in the back, some in the shoulder, some in the legs, some of them got missed altogether. So we dragged that one fellow out that got pierced pretty hard and made that and we pulled him up on the shore. But he only lived about ten, uh, about 20 minutes because he uh, he lost too much blood. So he, he like I say, uh, it was a bad mistake. It was something they, they uh, it should not have happened. Well, that wasn't the end of the mistakes there. Another thing that happened was that storm was ongoing. And daylight and night time and any other time, it was just like a fog. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And we kept getting the alert signs. They told us it might be a German paratroop attack. So keep your eyes open, just, just take care of business, you know. Well, at that point in time, we were all new soldiers. And we could not tell a German plane by the engine and motors, but we could learn what they were later on. When we saw a bomber or heard a bomber coming over, we knew right away whether it was a German or, or an American one. But we, at that time, we didn't know that, so everybody was just nervous. And when a first big bomber came over with paratroopers on it, you couldn't see them, but everybody fired up in the air. Well, everybody fired. I had, a, I had a magazine or two that I fired up there. And uh, you didn't know anything until the next morning. The next morning when it broke daylight, we saw some paratroopers hanging in the uh, olive trees in the city. And uh, most of them were dead. Some of them were just wounded, but most of them were dead. And we looked at them and he said near the patch on there, it was the 82nd Airborne. We were shooting our own men. And that wasn't only us from the infantry, but the Navy opened up and shot up in the air. It was just bad communication all the way around. And uh, that 504 uh, regiment uh, contains the 82nd Airborne. And uh, the statistics came out later on that altogether they lost 227 men by that friendly fire. So that's something that uh, that you don't like to see. I mean, your own friends getting killed like that just by different mistakes. 
So every, uh, I used to follow in the newspaper after the war, and there'd be a little clipping in there because somebody had to be held accountable for that incident, what happened with those paratroopers getting shot down. So it went on for several months, and then after that, they just said that they were going to quit the investigation because uh, they blamed it on the weather, it was a bad storm. They blamed it on bad communication. We got the wrong information. There were German paratroopers. We should have been on the alert. And then we were green soldiers. We were just young, just started. When we went into Sicily, we were the first Americans on, on European soil. And then after that, uh, things started happening a little faster. So the second day in Sicily, our objective thing was to go up to Comiso Airport. There's an airfield that there was about 20 miles north of where we were. And of course, when you're in the infantry, how are you going to go 20 miles? You're going to walk. You're going to walk in the infantry. So we walked up there, and we had the 158th artillery with us, and uh, they opened up with some small arms fire and everything, but they gave up right away. So right there at that airfield, we captured 450 soldiers. They were both Italian and Germans. And we captured uh, 120 airplanes that were on the field. And then we also captured 200,000 gallons of aviation fuel. And uh, all those that got captured got sent back to, uh, to different camps where they had the people that were, that were captured. So anyhow, we went into Sicily, a lot of small towns, but we went up to uh, uh, the northern part. Now, we were, when we were in Sicily, our outfit was on the western side, then on the right side was uh, Montgomery from uh, England. And uh, those two guys, Pat, my, my uh, generals at that time was Patton, George Patton and uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. They were my two generals. And uh, as long as we were going in the same direction, these two guys had a race to Messina, the uppermost part of the Sicily, where they had the Straits of, of Messina right there. To, it's only two and a half miles of water right there. But anyway, we, we went up there, but with Patton the way he is, he was a pusher. He would drive you. And we got there before he did. We got there a little bit before Montgomery got there. So he was proud of that. But anyway, uh, when we were up there in the northern part too, we had uh, uh, another thing that we observed, another thing happened there. And that was uh, with the town there of, uh, uh, I don't remember the name of it right now, it's a popular town down there. Do you know what that was, Patty? No, I forget uh, I forget it right now. Certain places and certain dates, I forget it right now. But anyhow, uh, there was a hotel on that, in that town, on that street. It was in Palermo. Is that Palermo? Palermo? P Palermo. Was that it? Yeah, Palermo. It was Palermo. <laughs> Came back. As a matter of fact, we were talking about Palermo. That was the headquarters for the mafia. They got the orders from from Palermo from from the uh, their gang, you know, whatever they had. They got the orders from that. So on that street, there was only one big hotel. And we were on a big black area on top of one hill, and we saw the Stuka dive bomber coming down, and he made one pass, went over, remember, to get his bearings. And that plane only has one bomb underneath of it. So it would dive down to a target, and then he'd pull the trigger on that and release that bomb. Well, we watched that plane come down, and we figured, you know, he's going to hit that hotel. It's the only big building on that street. And he was too quick with the trigger finger because he let the bomb go out quicker than it should have. And it, the 
bomb landed in the street and made a big crater <coughs> right in the street. And then when it got daylight the next day, we checked it all out and saw what happened. And you know who was in that hotel? Bob Hope and his troop. Oh. <laughs> Bob Hope in there, and they were going to put on a USO show for us back in the rear echelon a couple days later. So uh, there was Bob Hope, there was Francis Langford, the singer, there was Tony Romano, his guitar player, and there was another man in there, I never found out his name, but he worked with the sound system. Maybe he took care of the microphones and things like that. And so that was a close call. They could have all been wiped out if that guy with that stupid dive bomb. If he would have hit that hotel, they might have all have been gone. Mm. So you have to give them credit because a lot of those movie stars, uh, they didn't have to go there. They volunteered mm -hmm. to go overseas to help and put on a show, you know, so that the morale and the soldiers would be built up and all that. So, but I got to see different people like that. I got to see Marlena Dietrich, I saw George Raft, and I saw <coughs> Primo Canaire, remember the prize fighter, Italian prize fighter? He was a heavyweight boxer, the, the Primo Canaire. He put on an exhibition now. But all these people were over there, but uh, near that place, Palermo, was one of the biggest battles that we had in Sicily. It was called Bloody Ridge. It wasn't far from Palermo, so anyhow. Uh, we were getting ready there after about six weeks. We were getting ready to invade Italy. We were going, we were going into Italy, and uh, some of the other troops went in the southern part, like the British troops went into Raise your Calabria, but there was no action down there. They went down there. There was some some uh, ammunition dumps down there that they wanted to overtake. They wanted to get that. But but we went into went to Italy and then worked our way up north. But in Italy, and then I did, I got a different general. It was Mark Clark, and uh, we went up to. Uh, Mona Casino. There was a, there was a mountain there around Casino, and on top of that mountain was a monastery, and uh, we were in a valley below that, and it was a big artillery piece clear on the other side of the mountain, and they were using the uh, uh, monastery there for an FO forward observation post for the for the uh, artillery to fire the shells. So they were doing that, and our planes could never find them because the one big plane that they had there, uh, one, one big uh, train that they had there was called the Anzigo Express. We call them the Anzigo Express. Some people refer to it as uh, the Anzigo Annie. It was a huge cannon. It took 22 German soldiers to operate that cannon. And it was so massive that it was on train wheels with 38 uh, car wheels on it. And that big gun was on there. And uh, whenever they fired it, it would back in on the tracks in the caves, in the tunnels that they had built over all those years. So our airplanes could never find it at all. <coughs> so anyway, the president got wind that we were losing too many men down in that valley. So he gave the orders that they, they should get rid of that. So we used to watch those B-17s coming up, and they were going to hit targets up north of us. So this one morning after they got that order to wipe out that monastery, we saw the B-17s coming up and the B-24s come over also. And we saw the bomb bay doors opening. And we said they're going to hit that, which they did. They did, and they just leveled it off. They leveled. Then we were able to move out of that place. Before that, we were just pinned down and we lost a lot of men for that. So that, that's what happened at that point. But anyway, uh, during a war like that, 
you go from one place to another and you don't know what to get yet, what it's going to be. But some people you know, wonder about, uh, like with Patton, one with Patton, he was, he was a strict host. I mean, he was uh, uh, real hard with the people. He kept pushing and pushing all the time. I know the first time I got to talk with him, he came up to me and said, Soldier, he says, where are you from? I said, oh, I said, I come from some small town uh, in Elwood City. And uh, he said, well, he said, a lot of people here from small towns, he said, they don't all come here, here from New York City. And he said, oh, that's a heavy weapon you were carrying. So I was a BAR man. And, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that gun. And then he said, well, he said, you keep it clean. He said, well, someday it may save your life. So when it comes to that rifle, you'll see it here in the picture. That rifle weighed 21 pounds. The rifle itself weighed, it weighed uh, 20 pounds. No, it weighed 17. It weighed 17 pounds. The bipod that you put on the front uh, weighed 3 pounds. They took it up to 20. And then one magazine of 20 rounds was 1 pound. So altogether, fully loaded, it weighed 21 pounds. And uh, this is why we had a team. We had a team of three men. BAR teams. You had the gunner, system gunner, ammo carrier. These other two fellows, one of them was named, my assistant gunner was named Roy Zuber, the first one I had, and he was from Petersburg, West Virginia. The other one, and he carried a Springfield 03. And then the next man in there was, uh, he carried a Mauser. He carried an M1. And uh, he was from Hannibal, Missouri. So we had those three men, and they stayed with us pretty much of the time. But then we had we pulled back there, and we went up to to the place called Anzio. And uh, when we first got on the boats and went up there, we saw something altogether different. It was all level ground. Before that, we had been in some of the mountains in Italy, and it was. Uh, uh, so rough in those mountains that we were able, as infantrymen, we walked up those hills. But to get our supplies and ammunition and everything, you couldn't drive a truck up there. So the uh, two and a half tons GMCs, which they used a lot, they couldn't go. So what they did, they hired some mules from the farmers. And uh, they, got, they had a mule train there. These mules come up with supplies on them back and everything and come up to the mountains and gave us gave us our supplies and uh, what happened was too in that area if one of the mules or any of them got hit in a crossfire got killed they had to pay that for the government paid that farm of five hundred dollars for each mule that they lost so they, they, it looked to me like that time that they were the mules were worth more than what we had. <laughs> So, so we get up into the Edgeville, and you couldn't dig a foxhole at, at night. We just slept with foxholes. We always had two men would start digging. One man would have a pickmatic, would start digging the dirt. The other one had a shovel. Both of them had folding handles on them, so it would fit on your backpack. And, uh, you just dug. One one did the digging, one did the shoveling, and then you slept together, back to back, and then the heat from your body kept each other warm enough. So that's the way we went from one country to another, from one uh, campaign to another, was in foxhole. We didn't always, every night, sleep in the foxhole. If we found a barn that was empty, we would go and sleep in the barn. If we saw a church, it was vacant. People had evacuated uh, through all the colonies, and we'd go and stay there in the church. So we would do that. 
So th there's different times you just had to adjust yourself, but most of the time we slept in foxholes and uh, we had our shelter half, we had a piece of canvas, we had our blanket, each man had a blanket, and we had uh, our supplies there. We had our king of team, our mess kit and everything. We all had two uh, grenades that we carried all the time. And so it seems to me that the outfit that I was in, uh, not my own weight, but the extra weight that I had to carry from me was 60 pounds, about 60 <coughs> pounds more, because the uh, cartridge belt that I had was extra deep, because I had 10 of those magazines to fit in that cartridge belt to go around. That was an extra 10 pounds mm -hmm. that you had to do that. But then with all the other things, uh, you, you would have that. And then gun that I started talking about, uh, it used a lot of ammunition because if you if you fired the thing and you put the trigger on it, just held the trigger there, you got rid of 20 rounds in two and a half seconds. That's how fast. But the only thing faster than that was machine gun. Machine gun was faster than a DAR. So we had a few of those. You know, every company and every battalion had several of those uh, those Browning Browning automatic rifles. So it was something that you had to learn how to use it. You had to be a specialist at it because if you had to, if you go out in the field, out in the range, and it's your turn to learn to fire the BAR, uh, one of the drill sergeants, they put me wise to it. He says, now, if you want to hit the target, the bullseye, say, you don't aim at that because that gun jumps. <coughs> well, you know, it jumps like that. So he said, if you want to hit the bullseye, he said, you aim down at the lower end of the lower side of the target, down on the bottom. Mm -hmm. He says, and you'll get most of the shell, most of the bullets will go into the into the bullseye. So he taught me that. I think that's why they made me. I was one of the smallest men in the company. They give me the heaviest <laughs> 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 that's the <coughs> So we're, we're in Anzio now. And as we go through there, we see that over on the side there, and up on the side, they're not mountains, <coughs> but there's caves in there. Mm -hmm. And of course, by that time, the uh, Germans are catching up. I mean, they have good artillery and everything, and they kept firing at it. They kept firing at us, and uh, we, uh, we couldn't keep up with what they were doing. But well, we did a good job of it because I have a citation here, a presidential citation where our, our uh, uh, second battalion, which was I was in E tree in E, G, e Company, uh, they gave us that citation because we kept the Germans from advancing within a thousand yards. That, that uh, battle there lasted for a whole week, mm -hmm. solid, and uh, we kept them from coming any closer than a thousand yards. They threw at us about six battalions of German infantry through it there, so we got that commendation there. That's the highest award that a unit can get, the Presidential Unit Citation. So I have that here too, that you can look at later on. You can look at some of these things and if you have any questions and you, you could, I'll answer those. But uh, <clears throat> it was at that place there that I lost my gunner, my sister gunner, Roy Zuber. He got hit by a sniper one morning and he was wearing his helmet. If he wasn't wearing a helmet, that bullet would have probably gone right over his head. But he got hit right on top of the helmet and his uh, helmet with a steel on it that ricocheted with a bullet down the side of his face here and pulled out his left eye mm -hmm. and uh, so we put him in one of those caves and the artillery there was against us was so strong that we couldn't get him to a medic 
And, and what we did, we got his undershirt and we put a lot of that, we all carried on our pouch, on our belt, we carried that white uh, sulfadilinate powder. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay for the infection or something like that, but it's no good for pain. It doesn't help your pain. He needed something like morphine mm -hmm. or something like that. And we didn't have that many medics in the, in the army like that. You have a lot of soldiers, but you have one medic for maybe a hundred and some men that he has to take care of. You don't have that many beds. So anyway, he was in that cave there for three days, and he was suffering. He just uh, his eyeball was hanging down. The nerves were still hooked on him, and was bouncing like a yo-yo. He just stuck the back up with his head, and we bandaged him up. So, but I got to see Roy. Uh, at one of the camps, uh, we placed in camp and we got re outfitted because we were getting ready now to go into southern France. And uh, so I saw him walking at a distance there, so I walked up to him. And I said, Zuber, how are you doing? <laughs> he said, Oh, he says, I'm doing okay. And I looked at him and I laughed at him because Zuber had. One brown eye and one blue eye. <laughs> he said, yeah, go ahead and laugh. He said, everybody laughs at me. <laughs> so he said they promised him that when he got back to the States that they would fix him up right. <laughs> and uh, so he, uh, uh, they wanted to keep that socket open. So the, they didn't have the right size brown eye, but they had the right size blue eye. They just stuck that in his head. <laughs> and it worked good for him, too, because <coughs> several years later, my wife and I went on a camping trip down in Falling Waters, West Virginia. And I said, yeah. <coughs> so I looked on the map and I told my wife, you know, we're not too far from Petersburg. I said, why don't we drop down here and see if Zuber was still alive. She, she said, okay, we went down there and I went in the post office and I asked the postmaster, do you know anything about Rory Zuber? Do you know where he lives? He said, oh yeah. He said, we send a mail down there every day. And uh, he gave me the number of the house, gave me the street number, told me how many lights to go down, where to make the left turn. <laughs> so I went up there and went on the porch my wife stayed out in the car, and uh, she said, I'm not going to go up there, she said, because he might not be living, she said, it might be embarrassing one thing or another. So she said, you go up there yourself. So I went up there and knocked on the door, and Roy came to the door. He says, may I help you? And I didn't say a word. <laughs> he said, then he said again, may I help you? And I said, you son of a gun, Zuber, you don't remember me? Oh, he grabbed me and hugged me and said, tell me about it, come on in here. And he, uh, so I motioned to my wife to come on up here, come up here now. So we went in his house, spent the afternoon with him, talking about old times. And he was right, they fixed him up good. He had, now he had two brown eyes. <laughs> Down his face, down his face, my dad sold it up, you know, where he got injured with that. But it, it, it's bad when you have to lose somebody like that. And those, those things happen because you're, you're close as a brother when you're living with them like that. I mean, you're sleeping in the same foxhole with them. When they're in trouble, you help them out, they help you out. You're never there for yourself. You're there to help somebody else out. So, so from there we we moved from those caves. But before we left that place uh, at Anzio, there was heavy, heavy artillery fire that lasted for two weeks, and we had the uh, German uh, battalions coming after us. About six of them in in all, and we didn't yield to them more than a thousand yards have them away from us. We lost a lot of men, but we held our position there. And so we got a presidential unit citation, which is the biggest award that uh, a unit can get from, uh, from the president. And we got that, I have that here. So anyway, there's other things like that that it happened. So 
when, when we went, <coughs> when we were in France, we went to certain places like Saint Martin, Saint uh, Maxime, uh, Lelock, and Alex, a place called Alex, and there were some rough battles there. A lot of battles were pretty heavy, pretty strong. There at Alex, we had uh, we met the uh, German Mark VI big tank. Now we were there and saw that tank knock out five of our Sherman tanks, firing 88, 88, 88 shells. And we also got introduced to those uh, butterfly bombs. And uh, sounds like it'd be a pretty thing, but they were they were rough. The planes would fly over us. They had these bombs inside of a metal container. <coughs> And when they dropped them down there, they'd hit the ball and hit the ground, they would explode. And then the shrapnel would fly over a wide area. And also, uh, what a lot of people don't understand, when we first went into the war there, their weapons and everything were better than ours. They had more years to prepare for. They had factories and everything making that stuff. So later on, whenever they got it got scarce, they had to go underground, and they lost like a lot of their supplies, supply lines got bombed and things like that. But uh, we got introduced then to this other thing. They had a uh, like with our mortars. We had mortar men that they fired a, a mortar. It was one shell at a time. Now, they had one over there that was a six-barrel mortar. It was like a carousel. And once they released them and the thing went around with six mortars <coughs> in the air, that covered the big, the big area. That was a place where I got hit. I got hit there but, but with some fragment, but it wasn't much. It wasn't much. It was just a little bit in my leg, a little bit in my chest. So they sent me back for a field hospital. I was only there for three days. I was only there for three days. And uh, anyhow, you might have heard the story too, but that's when I went AWOL from there. <laughs> I was in that hospital, and the next morning, a major who was a doctor, a major comes through for bed check, and he saw that I wasn't in my bed. And he waited for me. So when I come back in, he said, where have you been, soldier? I said, I went out to the latrine. I had to go to the bathroom. I went to the latrine. And he started reading right at that. Oh, boy, you know, who do I think I was? They have nurses there. They have doctors. They have urinals, they had bedpans. <laughs> if I have to go, I have to call one of them to come over there. And, and I just didn't like the guy's attitude. <laughs> that afternoon, on the third day, that afternoon, I saw this truck, a tanker, and I saw in the bunker there, 45th headquarters company, 45th division. So I asked the driver, I said, are you going back up to the outfit? He said, yeah. I said, can I ride up with you? He said, yeah. I said, when are you going to leave? He said, right down, I'm going up. I said, okay. I jumped in and went up with them. <laughs> so the first place I went, I went up there and I went to my company there and I went to my company commander, Felix Sparks. And I said, Captain, I said, I think I'm in trouble. He said, why is that? I said, I'm AWOL. I said, I left that hospital with no discharge papers and everything. I said, they don't know anything about me. I said, they probably have the MPs up looking for me. <laughs> he said, Pricey, I'll tell you something. He said, they might be looking for you because you were missing down there, but I guarantee you they're not coming here. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. He said, don't worry about it. He says, I'll take care of it. He said, get your gear ready. He said, we'll pull it out in the morning. So he, he saved the day for that. So, but anyhow, that was my story about uh, going AWOL. So I went to the right place, too. I went to my outfit. I was safe there from the MPs. <laughs> yeah, so from there, 
From there, we also went. Let me fix your mic for you. Oh. We don't have to hold it all the time. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. So from there, we went up to the Lost uh, Trees Mountains, and it was winter time then, and there was snow and rain, cold weather, bitter, bitter cold. But we got outfitted before that with parkas and, and heavy socks and new shoes and new clothing and everything like that. And um, But I had read some place where we were the first soldiers to ever do any battle at the Lost Jews Mountains up there. And hardly anybody did any fighting there. They wouldn't go near the place. So anyway, from there we worked down into close into Germany and went across the Rhine River. And uh, and then from there we went to different towns like Alsenburg and Reipertswerler and Nuremberg, places there, a lot of places in there. And it was getting to the point where Hitler uh, was finally realizing that it, he might be near an end, something could happen. Because the prisoners that we were taken then, some of them were like 79 years old. And then other ones that came in with their hands over the top of their head, those kids were 14, 14 years old. So they were hitting the bottom of the barrel. They were losing a lot of men. They lost their supply lines. They lost a lot of things in there. So as we went there, we were headed, we were supposed to go to Munich, Munich, Germany. It was a big city, and that's a place where they started the Nazi program, was in, in, in that city. But our company commander, who was, by that time, he got promoted, he was a lieutenant colonel, Felix Park. They told him, swing down to that cow, see what's going on. And so we did. It was about 10 miles away from Beauty. So we went down there, and when we first went in, we had, you saw that the front of the camp, they had four big towers up there and had machine gunners up in there. But we went in the back side where they had. I think it was 52 different guards. So Heinrich Himmler, who was in charge of that camp, he saw what was happening. So he pulled out of there and he took his best soldiers so out there, the SS troopers, he took them out and he skipped out of there. And he never, he never lived to, uh, to stand trial, those Duenberg trials, because they gave him a cyanide tablet. He put that in his mouth. And he committed suicide. He just died. But when we went in there, it was something that we were not prepared for. We never saw anything like that in our life. We saw people getting hit, getting wounded. We saw them die. We saw many of them get killed different ways. But when we went in there, we, we never saw anything like that. We saw this training car over there. It had 39 cars on it, I believe. And we, saw, we thought that there were logs on there, piled on there. Here we got closer and we found out there were human beings laying mm -hmm. on there. And, uh, so we saw all the other people coming out of the barracks and everything once they saw who we were. But the soldiers ourselves, it, with all the, uh, with, with, with all of the uh, commotion that was going on, uh, there had to be some kind of order taken. So our, our company commander had that 45 <coughs> and he fired it up in the air and told them that everybody stop shooting and do this. They had those guards out there and and we had one fellow that set up his machine gun and he started to fire that way. And all, everybody 
fell down to the ground, but then whenever everything cleared up, there was only 17 that stood up. Some of them did get hit with that machine gun. So anyway, we weren't allowed to give them any food because the medics told us that if you feed them, they're so undernourished, meant that they would uh, probably die. So they took them and sent them to the different hospitals, to the different countries that to nourish them, that to help the kids. So that's what they did. So at that cow there, we got out, we liberated 31,000 people. But uh, over 2,000 were in there dead. And the smell, the stench and everything in there, a lot of soldiers, they just sat down and they cried because they've never saw anything like that before. Some of them vomited. And lots of us just did so. He just vomited, got sick, everything. So, so we got out that place. But then we had this one more mission. We had to go into beauty. Dad, <coughs> tell them about the soup. Hmm? Tell them about the soup that the... Oh, yeah. Well, before we went to Munich, then, we got checked over and everything, and the medics were around there. Now, Jaime Hitler, when he pulled out of there, he told his guards, he says, I don't want to see one man alive in that camp. So what happened was, the next day, we got there just in time, because the next day, they were going to give all the inmates a bowl of soup. And these people were starving. I mean, you could see the bones on their, on their body. And anybody that hungry is going to eat soup in there. The medics checked out those kettles on that big stove. They were all poisoned. Oh. They were all poisoned. So we got in there. Just the right day. The next day would have been too late. Instead of liberating 31,000, we would have lost a lot of work because of that. Then we had to go on to Munich, Germany, and, and the city was just bombed out bad. So there weren't uh, too many occupants in there, even. There were a few tanks, it was still mined, the streets were mined, and there were still snipers in some of the buildings. But they gave up pretty quickly. They, whenever they saw the uh, force coming at us, we had a lot more people there than what they had. And uh, so that was May the 8th. Now we liberated that town. <coughs> on April the 29th. My birthday is on the 26th. So three days later, uh, we liberated that cow on, on the 29th. And at that time, I was uh, I was 23 years old. So then I stayed in the Army of Occupation for another six months. I couldn't come home right then after three and a half years. But there was a couple of reasons I wanted to stay there. We had some German prisoners of war that were on detail work. And uh, we had this one guy that, uh, uh, Werner is his name, a German guy, and uh, I made friends with him. He could speak English. And he said that whatever, the, before the war started, he was going to some college and he was going to be an architect. He took studies and blueprints, stuff like that. So, so he had uh, those visions in there, and then a war broke out. And same thing with me. I didn't want. To, I had other plans. I didn't want to go to war. I never had a rifle. Never fired a rifle. Didn't know what it looked like, but they showed me all about it. <laughs> so he, uh, he was a good friend of mine. And another thing, my grandparents. They were both living. And they were down the southern part of Italy, and I wanted to go visit them. That would have been something nice. So I stayed in another six months. And uh, this fellow, Werner, he asked me to do him a favor. And I said, yeah, I'll do this. What do you do? He said, I'd like to have a smoking pipe. 
I said, okay. He said, I'll get you one of those and mail it to you. Then he said, I'd like to have a can of tobacco for that pipe. <laughs> I said, I could do that. And he said, well, I'd like to have also one pair of those white athletic socks because you can't get them in Germany any place. I said, okay, I'll do that. So when I come home, I went up to Cleveland. I was working up there as a machinist. And I worked at several places up there. I worked at Tom Motors. I worked at uh, all of the Cliff Track and uh, different places before I went back to L with the, the standard. So I worked up there for about eight years. So I went to a high school where they taught German. So I have the letter right there that he wrote me. It's in German and she translated for me in English. And it's right there. So I went to the, to the drugstore and I got him that fresh medical pipe. And I got him a can of tobacco and I think it was Prince, Prince Elbert or something like that. <laughs> and they went to a haberdashery store up there where they had underwear and socks and things like that. So I got them a package of six or eight pairs of socks. Boy, he was thrilled at that. They wrote me another letter. <laughs> so anyhow, it's, it's something like that. But when, when, when you're in the war, you say it's hard to get your rifle and fire at somebody. You know, it, it's a bad thing. You know? In the very beginning, you think, well, oh, it's just like murdering somebody. But when they they're had, they have a rifle or whatever, and they're firing back at you, it's a lot easier. <laughs> it's a lot yeah. easier. So you just go on instinct. And you're trained to do that. You're trained to do that. But uh, I know that uh, we used to get the stars and the stripes every once in a while. And there was some girl that was traveling across the country. I don't know whether she was a whack or a rave, or I don't know what she's doing. But she was doing something because when I when my outfit was in France, we had heard that uh, the government had passed a law that anybody that was in combat should get paid a little bit more money. So that meant the combat infantrymen, the combat medics, or anybody like that was in the combat. So on our paychecks, we got $10 more a month. Wow. We didn't need that. I mean, what are you going to do with $10 more or whatever? So we got that. But while she was making a speech, and she knew about that, she referred to us as high-paid killers. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, we read that in the paper. Uh, I don't know what her name was. I forget it. But after that, her name was Mud. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that, that was like a bonus thing or something like that. So then I had to go down and see my grandparents, so my supply sergeant gave me two barracks bags just filled with everything. I mean, he had flour and sugar and had shoes and trousers and shirts and everything. So I got on a train and I went down there southern part of Italy, down at Ranger of Columbia. And, I, and my grandma told me that when she saw me, that I looked just like her son did when he left. He was 17 years old when he left there. But he wasn't old enough to come by himself. But he had a brother-in-law who was in his 20s. So they came over together. And uh, so while I'm talking with her, she sees this bag he's a flour or sugar, but she sees some grains on top of it. So she put her finger in her mouth and touched that, put it in her mouth, and it was sugar. And she said, you know, that's the first time I tasted sugar in four years. Because oh, wow. all their food was rationed to the German army. Mm -hmm. they couldn't, anything they had was what they raised on their own ground. They couldn't buy anything, so it was bad for civilians every place. Mm -hmm. Civilians getting to see things is kind of hard to do. <coughs> I know one time on one of the evacuation, I saw people that were leaving the town to go to some higher place because the city was getting blown down. 
So when you're going to have to evacuate from your house and go someplace else, what are you going to do? You would take your prized possession, whatever you want, and you try to carry it. So I guess one girl going up the hill, a steep hill, she going up there, she's about 19 years old, strong girl. You know what she had on her head going up there? She had a Singer sewing machine, <laughs> <laughs> upside down, and it was on her head, and she was held in hold like this, carrying it on her head, and had her hand to balance it and everything. And I saw one of those singers right at home. My mother had one. So somebody had sent her one years ago. Maybe she made clothes for her family or whatever. But uh, yeah, she was carried down. Oh, yeah. You, you learn about people and see how they live in different things. I don't know. I think it's good time for some questions if you're. <laughs> All right.